Hi to everyone. I'm Naomi Schachter. I head international relations at the National Library of Israel. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the NLI series of private English language events for special library friends. We're glad you're here. We're thinking about all that is going on in the States at this time and hope that somehow things will be resolved and perhaps some positive change, but uh, it, it truly is a, a very challenging time, both in terms of the pandemic and in terms of uh, the, what's going on in the States. Although seem, things seem to be a bit more peaceful from what I've heard in recent days. I also, um, because we were supposed to have many NLI USA board members here, I want to publicly extend condolences to our esteemed board member, Stanley Fisher, on the passing of his wife, Rhoda. Uh, actually, the funeral is, is taking place now and our thoughts are with him. Uh, I'm very excited to let you know that uh, because our virtual, what we call the library reading room, has become so popular uh, here in Israel and abroad, but it's mainly in Hebrew at this time, but we've had literally tens of thousands of visitors. And based on this, this is something that we developed um, you know, a series of virtual programs. It was launched in late March uh, with the onset of Corona. Uh, we are now starting in July, the international reading room where there will be many, many English language events and other languages as well. And um, we're very excited about this. And as soon as we have the link and things are going, which will be in the coming weeks, we will forward it to you. And we have some really wonderful events planned already. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I want to now introduce the main speaker, Stefan Litt, Dr. Stefan Litt, my wonderful colleague. He is the curator for general humanities here at the library and an archival expert. He's in charge of the European language holdings, including the archives of figures such as Martin Buber, Stefan Zweig, Max Brode, and many others. He received his doctorate in pre-modern Jewish history from the Hebrew University. And he has taught in Germany, Austria, Hebrew University, and Bar Ilan. He's published on the history of early modern European Jewry and on modern Jewish archival collections. Given the extensive exposure that we have received around our Kafka collection, and Stefan is the library spokesperson about this, he's something of a local celebrity for sure. Maybe I can even say international celebrity. He's also a wonderful colleague, great to work with, and uh, I look forward to hearing his presentation. Stefan. All right, thank you so much, Naomi, and welcome to everyone. I'm really happy that all of you joined us today, today and I know that's a complicated time, as Naomi mentioned already before. And uh, the more I hope to give you some uh, interesting insights into um, a very fascinating story around uh, archival materials, I would like to um, invite you to join me into a journey that um, includes international figures of literature and fascinating archival materials, which have been created more than 100 years ago. And our journey will begin in um, Austria in the year of 1924, when exactly a young man named uh, Franz Kafka died in a sanatorium in Kierling, in a tiny little place uh, northwest of Vienna. 
who later on became most famous, and I don't have to explain to you for what he is uh, regarded maybe one of the 10 leading authors of all times in modern literature, literature for sure. And um, in fact, he wasn't that famous back in those days. His close friend, Max Brod, who will accompany us for very often tonight, um, has uh, had in these times a much better standing. Uh, he was an acclaimed author, uh, almost uh, internationally famous, um, in contrary to Franz Kafka, who back in 1924 and definitely before was uh, almost an unknown personality. personality. So Kafka, as you know, uh, died from uh, tuberculosis. Uh, he suffered for seven years from this disease and developed most severe symptoms. At the end, he passed away on June 3rd in the year of 1924, <clears throat> which is now almost exactly 96 years ago. He um, loved to read, to produce, to create, to write until his very last day. We have uh, testimonies about that. So um, being in this situation, he had materials around him literally until his last day. And um, other materials of his private uh, archival collection were scattered at different places. In uh, the home of his girlfriend, Dora Diamant, who was with him during his last days in Austria, although she was living actually with him before in Berlin in a tiny apartment. And there have been also other materials which were kept in <clears throat> the home in this parents' place um, of Kafka's in uh, Prague. So the, the, the right uh, start of uh, Kafka's archive was not in the best situation, I would say, um, when it comes to terms of preservation and bringing materials together in a central point. So shortly after Kafka's passing, Max Brod saved most of these materials, of the written materials, and did not do what his best friend asked him several times to do, uh, both in written form and also in, a, in private talks at least once, to collect everything just in order to destroy it. Max Brod denied to do so, although he could find two uh, written notes, requests in the handwriting of Franz Kafka, who was asking him to do so. So this is one of the two. This is a tiny sheet of paper, actually, um, where Kafka uh, said in, in springtime 1922, two years before he died, and also then he felt that he was not in the best shape, that he asks Max Brod to collect everything that he could find. He also um, calls it in the German word, you see it in the second row up here, it's called Nachlass. This is a written estate after someone is dying, but still Kafka was uh, still alive in those days, but he could see what was going to happen. So he asks both to collect everything uh, written, which is uh, kept in, uh, in bookshelves, in his cabinet, in his desk, both at, at home and in his office. And um, where else he could find it to bring all those materials, meaning diaries, manuscripts, letters, uh, letters from others and his own, and um, drawings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just to one place in order to burn everything without reading it. So, as we also know, otherwise I couldn't uh, give you this lecture tonight. Max Brod denied to do so; he ignored both of these um, requests, the written requests, and also the, the one he was given by Kafka in a private discussion. And uh, for those of you familiar with the, with the edition of the famous novel, The Trial by Franz Kafka, there is an afterword by Max Brod, where he explained why he didn't follow the request of his friend. Because in his own words, he said to Kafka, he had said to Kafka that, he felt that asking him, his best friend, who was so much evaluating Kafka's writing, um, to destroy everything was definitely not the right way. And he was definitely not discussing the point with the right person, because Brod would never do this. And uh, on the other side, I mean, if Kafka was really so keen to, to have it done, why didn't he burn it by himself? Anyway, uh, he didn't do it. And uh, Max Bode also um, declined to do so. In contrary, uh, immediately after Kafka died, and we have testimonies that it was literally a week later, 
Max Brod became, uh, began editing, not just collecting the manuscripts, but also editing them in order to prepare them for print. So he was right away doing exactly the opposite of what was Kafka ask he was asking him not to publish anything beyond what have been published before. And um, we know that uh, Brod discovered, not really discovered, he was of course aware about the existence of, this, of the three major novels that Kafka uh, created before, the Trial, America, and The Castle, none of them finished. So Max Brod uh, took those manuscripts, massive manuscripts, and prepared them for print. Changed here and there, sometimes even a bit more than what was appropriate, so that the first editions are uh, different from later editions which follow the original versions created by Kafka. So um, not just enough with that, between 1925 and 27, Max Brod published those three uh, major volumes of Kafka's novels. And uh, in the mid thirties, he came to um, an agreement with Kafka's mother who was still alive then and with the publisher, uh, Salman Schocken, who was from Germany and immigrated to Palestine after he had founded a publishing house, the Shock and Books, which is still existing both in the US and also in, in Israel. And by the way, um, Shock and was able to acquire the copyrights, the world copyrights of Franz Kafka's work from his parents. And um, the company held those rights until they were uh, seizing in 1994. So Max Brod came to them with, a, with the uh, ag agreement that he was um, creating a series of Kafka's collected works, which he started exactly in the mid 1930s. The first two volumes appeared in Germany and others later on in the States. And after World War II, of course, uh, the whole story um, got much more impressive dimensions. So just in, in order to make things sure, without Max Brod, we would hardly discuss Kafka's works because uh, Brod was the one who indeed made Kafka a famous author and uh, one of the leading figures in world literature. In March 1939, however, Max Brod was forced to immigrate to Palestine or at least to leave uh, Czechoslovakia. As you know, in March uh, 1939, Czechoslovakia was um, um, uh, taken by the Germans, by the Nazis, and brought, and together with another friend, a close friend of uh, Kafka and him, uh, called uh, Felix Welch, they both immigrated to Palestine. Brod uh, was really <clears throat> keen to take Kafka's original papers with him personally to Palestine and had them at his home for the first uh, couple of years after he settled down in Tel Aviv, where he would live until the end of his days. In 1941, however, the Second World War also reached for a short period Palestine with the air raids by the Italians on Tel Aviv and Broad was uh, uh, very anxious to keep them uh, furthermore in his private home and came to an agreement with the same Salman Shokin, who was the publisher of Kafka already to deposit them in his private library building in Jerusalem. For those of you who are familiar with Jerusalem, maybe you've seen it once, it's opposite the prime minister's office in, um, in the Balfour Street. It's a beautiful building um, planned and uh, realized by the famous architect uh, Erich Mendelssohn, who came also from Germany and who was uh, the architect of uh, Schocken's department stores in Germany before in the Weimar Republic era. So um, Schocken, who had this huge private library with this beautiful building, um, agreed to, to Brod's request and uh, gave him a private bank vault uh, in the basement of the building so that the materials were locked away for a couple of years in a um, comparatively safe place. In order to be sure what's in there, Max Brod produced this list. And this is something that we found uh, among the materials. I'll refer to it later on, how we got them and why we got them. Uh, in any case, the, um, the headline says that uh, this is the Kafka archive in the library Schocken in Jerusalem. And you see that we have all the, fam the famous uh, works here. You have the letter to the father, you have America, 
the, the trial and process, the Schloss, the, the castle, all of these novels, you have uh, travel diaries, uh, minor um, pieces of literature. And then we have here the aphorisms, the famous ones, and we have also, and I refer to that also uh, at the end, uh, Hebrew exercises. Kafka was actively studying Hebrew, by the way, also starting in 1917, the same year when he got the diagnosis that he is sick from tuberculosis, and followed those um, studies almost until the end of his life. And uh, just a year ago, we were able to have the proof, to get the proof that he was uh, quite advanced in his Hebrew studies. I'll show that to you as well later. After the end of World War II, things became uh, more quiet in Palestine, except, of course, the uh, War of Independence. But uh, then, already in 1956, there was another conflict. Um, maybe uh, you know that uh, this was uh, one of the first wars Israel fought with his neighbors. That's the Suez Crisis, about the... Uh, uh, the, the um, yeah, uh, discussions, uh, say it friendly, with the Egyptians about uh, free access to the Suez Channel and uh, Brits and the French involved in that too. So again, Kafka was worried about those materials, even uh, the uh, possibility to have it stored in um, Schocken's library didn't seem to him sufficient enough. So he decided to bring most of those materials to Switzerland. Switzerland forever a very forever a very um, quiet place and um, most likely very untouched for hundreds of years and that was for him the perfect match. He opened there in a central bank in uh, right in the center of Zurich um, something that he called uh, a safe archive and transferred most of Kafka's paper, papers uh, to there to Switzerland in order to make sure that they are in a safe place. Um, during all those years, he was continuing to publish uh, even tiny works, aphorisms, unfinished works uh, by Kafka, which have never been planned to be published by the author himself, but uh, Brod did so and produced indeed a very impressive series of books, which is available to us uh, still in libraries and even in secondhand bookshops. You can find them. Of course, there have been uh, later editions, which are much more um, uh, following the, the original handwritings. <clears throat> During all those years also Kafka was in contact with the heirs of Kafka. As you know, Kafka had three sisters, all of them were murdered in, in the Holocaust, but those sisters had children, daughters I think exclusively, and they found each other after the war <clears throat> and uh, also found Max Brod. And in the beginning they had um, very friendly relations to each other, and uh, at a certain point, it came to the question, what about the original manuscripts and materials? Because uh, the family was well aware that Kafka asked Max Brod not to do exactly what he did, but he, uh, to collect those materials in order to destroy them. Okay, he didn't do so. He published them. And by doing so, he also produced a good um, bunch of royalties, which went, to, of course, to the family because they were the heirs. And the family argued with Max Brod that uh, although he saved those materials at least twice, he was uh, not the rightful owner of them, of most of them. So in 1962, they came to an agreement that Max Bord had to restitute those materials to the family, meaning that most of it went uh, back from Israel to Europe, um, to Great Britain, and uh, the family decided to deposit most of the collection in Oxford's Bodleian Library, and that forms today the biggest Kafka collection worldwide. In 1968, however, Max Brod died. <clears throat> Before he died, he had appointed his last secretary, Ilse Esther Hoffe, to be the executor of his will. And as we know, they had a very close relationship to each other. And uh, Mrs. Hoffer was very keen to be sure what about the remaining Kafka manuscripts and handwritings, which have been part of Max Bord's private estate. 
So he signed twice a document saying that he was giving all those materials as a gift to Mrs. Hoffe. And these documents became crucial 10 years ago during uh, the, long, the long and exhausting court deliberations which we had here in Israel about the fate of the papers of Max Brod, including the Kafka, the remaining Kafka manuscripts. Because um, Esther Hoffe understood that the appointment was just not just to be the executor of his will, but also the owner of all those materials. And for sure, she argued that the Kafka materials have been given to her as a gift twice. Uh, she had the documents. But there's a certain point, and that was uh, the question when um, the National Library was uh, trying to put its hands on, on the whole collection in, uh, in a court um, story, which was almost never ending 10 years ago. Before I go to that, I would like just to mention that between 1971 and 88, at least, uh, Mrs. Hoffe sold a number of items, of mostly Kafka items, which she believed were hers, in public auctions. And uh, she started for sure by doing so in 1971 with a number of uh, letters and minor manuscripts by Kafka and the biggest story, of course, was in 1988 when she decided to give away the manuscript of the novel The Trial, which was auctioned in uh, London and Sotheby's and was sold for $2 million. That's, of course, something that uh, we cannot reverse. That will, that's lost for the collection, but at least it's in good hands. And it's today stored in the and the collections of the uh, German National Literature Archive in Marbach. So what was going on when Mrs. Hoffe died in 2007? Her two daughters tried to um, get the acknowledgement of the inheritance and asked the court, uh, the family court in Tel Aviv to open the inheritance to them. And that was the moment when the National Library in Jerusalem said, uh, well, wait for a second, because we know that there's some crucial function that Mrs. Hoffe, who passed away, had to fulfill, was being the executor of Max Bord's will. And that has never been finished, because in his will from 61, he said that he would like her to find an appropriate place for his papers. And he mentions at the first place the University Library of Jerusalem, which was our function, the function of the National Library before 2007, or the Municipal Library in Tel Aviv, or another collection inside or outside Israel, which may fulfill the basic needs for keeping such a good collection. So Mrs. Hoffe never did so. She had negotiations with us in the 1980s and uh, even after that, but never could decide to give those materials uh, in, in good hands and in, in good treatment under conditions which are much more appropriate, of course, than in a private home in Tel Aviv. However, um, our standing in 2007 opened a long saga, a legal saga, um, in three courts in Israel, starting with the family court in Tel Aviv, the um, district court in Tel Aviv, and it was ended in 2016, even at the Supreme Court, because we were arguing those materials have been promised to the National Library by Max Brod, and they are not the private property of the Hoffe family. And the Hoffe family said exactly the opposite. And um, to our pleasure, of course, all instances, all the um, different courts decided unanimously that the materials are not the belongings of the Hoffe family, but have to be deposited at the National Library in Jerusalem. So following this um, decision in 2016, we were able to reach uh, one place after another where those materials have been kept. We began in uh, one of the two banks. We knew about bank vaults in Tel Aviv. There, this is um, one of them where we just came outside the, the, the safe uh, room in the basement. And as you can see, the materials have been kept there in very different uh, 
ways. So there have been these metal boxes, which are um, um, a good idea to store these um, materials in a bank safe. But then you see also these uh, tied up the piles of manuscripts and even in plastic bags, which is of course not a good and proper way to keep those precious materials. By the way, most of the materials you see here are parts of Max Brod's personal archive, which of course is for us crucial and also very, very important because he was a leading figure of European and later on uh, Palestinian pre-state Israel and Israel um, culture. And for that reason, we were so keen to get those materials. In the second bank in Tel Aviv, it looked very similar. Um, materials have been locked there in, uh, in um, boxes, simple boxes, and also uh, tied up again, piles of manuscripts, diaries, and so on. And um, again, that's not the best way to keep those items. Another story which was going on simultaneously and which found a good end in uh, May last year in 2019 at the uh, residency of the Israeli um, ambassador in Germany, whom you can see right in the middle, that's Mr. Um, Jeremy Isaharov, who is right now uh, receiving from the vice president of the German federal poli uh, poli um, police some uh, original items which have been captured by the German police a year ago or a year before that. And that's also a, a very interesting story because in 2013, those materials have been offered by an Israeli art dealer to the National Literature Archive in Germany. <clears throat> it was declared that those materials have been rightfully given by the Hoffe family to this art dealer and uh, they are his own and he is entitled to do whatever he wishes to do with them. So he was trying to sell them. Our colleagues in Germany told us, listen, there's something very strange going on. Maybe you should check that. And we did so uh, for a couple of years, those materials disappeared literally from our eyes. And then by, just by chance, the German federal police, uh, by doing a, a, another or following another uh, story, found those materials just by chance in a, in a storeroom. And uh, again, we had to fight uh, even before a German court about the fate of those materials that we were granted um, at the end and in a very nice and uh, touching um, event in Berlin, we received them from the hands of the German federal police and uh, they were given to our ambassador and later on uh, David Bloomberg, uh, may, most of you should know him, the uh, um, director of his our board, uh, received them from the hands of uh, the ambassador. So there was another piece of this uh, major puzzle that uh, came back to Israel. And that's maybe the, the most important day, which was um, happening right exactly a year ago in Switzerland, in Zurich, in the same bank, I was mentioning before, when um, finally, after again having uh, court deliberations in Switzerland in order to get acknowledgement of the Israeli court ruling that it's also valid for Swiss uh, court rules, those materials have been given to us in a very uh, touching moment. And here I have even a short footage I would like to share with you. So you can see again, those uh, metal boxes um, filled very densely with those materials. I have to admit that they are, most of them are in, in good shape. They survived all those decades in Switzerland very well. But of course for us, it was a really touching moment. And uh, there have been days that we couldn't believe that it would happen to us one day that we could open those boxes and bring the materials. Um, back to, to Israel, where they have been originally brought to by Max Brod in 1939. So indeed, those boxes included most of the most important 
uh, remaining Kafka items in Max Bode's papers. And I would like to tell you a bit more about what actually was in there. <clears throat> so one of the very first um, attempt of Kafka to produce literature was already in 1907 till 1909. And this is something which remained, of course, almost uh, typical for Kafka, a fragment. He never finished that story. It was intended to be a novel called uh, Wedding Preparations in the Country, according to Max Brod. There's uh, not a single place where Kafka by himself wrote this title down. But Brod uh, was uh, very convinced that Kafka once told him that this is about uh, this is the, the title forthcoming for the novel. So it's also very symptomatic what's uh, actually the, the plot of this novel. There's the young man living in a, in a big town and uh, he found a bride in, on a countryside where he was going to visit her in order to make those wedding preparations with her. And in none of the three versions that we can see here, <clears throat> um, the bride even appears not to mention even a marriage or whatsoever, because uh, Kafka wouldn't deal with that. So even in his uh, early days, uh, being not really a, um, an author already, but uh, trying to be one, he was struggling with the whole issue about uh, marriage and finding an appropriate partner for life. So you can see we have three versions and they differ very much, not in the plot, but in their length. The first one is, uh, concludes or includes 60 of those tiny uh, sheets, which have been filled on both sides, almost without leaving a single space. And uh, the second version, which is by the way, also written in a different handwriting. And maybe you know that uh, German is characteristic for an old style of handwriting, which was typical until the mid 20th century. And it has changed in the beginning, from the beginning of the, um, early 20th century and of course today that's still the, the standard writing and Kafka was changing this handwriting. The first version is in this old German style and the second one in, um, in late 1907 most likely because that's the year when he changed it is in his new typical handwriting that is so familiar to many many uh, fans of Kafka worldwide. That's just uh, um, six sheets and the last one is just three sheets and then he gave up and never finished that story. So that novel was uh, existing only in theory, but he kept, of course, all these uh, different versions among his papers and um, maybe he even gave them to Kafka as a gift, although I could never find an, an official uh, document saying so. However, Kafka, uh, sorry, Max Brod was able to claim that those materials are his own and uh, kept them among his papers. There's uh, another work also quite early. It's uh, said to be written in 1909. <clears throat> and this is a kind of autobiographical sketch. It's closely related to a much larger work that uh, some of you for sure know. That's the letter to his father. And we have to speak about that too uh, in a minute. So that's uh, a kind of um, looking back to his days in, in school, in high school even when Kafka felt that he was underestimated, um, that people did not evaluate correctly his abilities and uh, not just his, his mates in school, his teachers, but even his family. And, and then again, that uh, work doesn't have a title. It's again, a fragment. Some uh, sheets are missing at the end and the, the, the last sheet doesn't exist any longer at all. But it starts also very Kafka stylish. Um, saying, when I was a schoolboy, I was uh, dumb, but not the dumbest with my fellows in class. So you see that he was right from the beginning, not uh, very sure about his own standing and position. And we know that he was all the time fearing about the quality of his writing and about his general quality of being a human being. What else did we find? Um, these three, tiny notebooks, which are very interesting and have been published by Max Brod, of course. Um, these are travel diaries uh, written down in 1911 when he traveled with Max Brod together to 
uh, Switzerland, Northern Italy, and at the end to Paris, where they love to stay so much that they even did it three times. And uh, the notebook on the left hand side is the first one. It starts um, at the 22nd, uh, sorry, 26th of August 1911. And it starts right away with the uh, motivation of writing these travel diaries. Roth and Kafka, before they uh, left Prague for this journey, decided to write uh, independently and each one by himself uh, these diaries. And at the end, they would give them to each other and work on the other's diary. So in the end was, uh, the, the, the hoped outcome was a novel, a joint novel, which even had a title, Richard and Samuel describing their journey and their different impressions on that journey. So the idea in general is not that, but Kafka was skeptical. Right on the first sheet, he said, right in the beginning, the bad idea to write um, travel diaries and to develop them into a novel. So he wasn't convinced from the beginning that that's going to work. He was right. Uh, maybe he was uh, intending to, to block the whole story, but um, Actually, the, the first chapter did appear in a, liter in a literature newspaper or journal in, in German uh, under the same title, Richard and Samuel, but it was never finished again. <clears throat> and now I also mentioned before already the famous work, The Letter to His Father, which is uh, maybe the typical letter that many young men uh, could write to their fathers and definitely back in those days, uh, kind of making um, a clear table between them. Complaints and uh, um, going back to stories which had not been so pleasant with his father and uh, criticizing his father. And Kafka was um, writing on and on and on and on. And you see these are um, large sheets uh, that's um, folio format. And we have 46 of them. So that's a very long letter. And the, the finish hasn't been done in this typewritten style, but that's handwritten. That's the last sheet. And uh, even going until the, the signature Franz. So there are several uh, stories about this uh, piece of literature, which it is. Um, the story goes like that, that uh, Kafka indeed was writing this document in order to say once and forever to his father what he was really thinking about him and why he was so disappointed by him. He did so in handwriting. There is a first version, which is kept in Germany in the literature archive. And then for any reason that we don't know what it was, he decided to type the same text. So that's this version that we found in Switzerland in the bank vaults. And uh, maybe he was intending even to send it to his father because also the style, if you see the, the first page here on the left side, that very much reminds a good letter um, with the, uh, um, first line saying dear father and so on so it looks like a letter <clears throat> and there's also rumors i don't know how sure they are that uh, kafka even gave this version to his mother asking her to give it to his father and she had to peek on it and said listen you cannot give that to this father to your father that that will end this family if you do so so it was uh, locked away and um, never reached the um, the addressee so Kafka's father never read it. It was published by Max Brod only in 1952, after all of this generation has passed away and never could feel really uh, insulted anymore. And that's a really uh, a touching and very heavy piece of literature. And those of you who haven't read it, I can just uh, recommend it to you. What else um, there have been, and there's of course no, um, dispute about uh, the rightful place of those materials in, Kafka, in Max Brod's papers. Uh, there are more than 250 letters and postcards sent by Kafka to his friend. And Brod, who was convinced right from the beginning that Kafka is such an important personality and the leading figure in thinking and literature, and the very original man, uh, kept all those letters. <clears throat> and brought them to Palestine and locked them again back in, uh, uh, in uh, first in Jerusalem and later on in Switzerland. But um, he published them by himself together with his own letters sent to Kafka. 
and uh, later on they have been of course uh, republished uh, in, in a critical style by researchers and uh, right now the last volume is to be uh, released very soon and um, based of course on those touching documents by the way the postcard here on the right hand side that's the very last one that it's preserved i don't know if it's the last one that kafka sent to max bolt it, uh, it the stamp says here it's the 20th of may um, 1924, meaning that it's uh, two weeks before he died. And there's even some lines here in the handwriting of Dora Diamant, of Kafka's girlfriend, who was with him in Kierling in that tiny place in Austria. So um, this is what we received. And that makes us, of course, very proud because um, now for sure, the National Library in Jerusalem is one of the three big places holding about 99% of Kafka's handwritings. Again, at the first place is um, Oxford, and it will never uh, be reached, of course, because the collection is so large and so important. Then there's the Literature Archive in Germany. They have uh, collected a number of materials, um, mostly bought them at auctions, and among them also the, the manuscript of the famous novel, The Trial. And now we are also on the map uh, with the last part, including all these precious items and even more. And I would like to show you some more. We, that was a big surprise to us. We knew that Kafka was uh, um, producing drawings from time to time. He, was never, he would never claim that he was a painter and he never published anything of those. But uh, there have been uh, tiny drawings which later on have been published by Max Brod in uh, several occasions. And in addition to those that we knew about then, we could find a complete notebook filled with all kinds of doodles and um, tiny drawings, sometimes uh, quite interesting ones, sometimes, yeah, just a doodle, <laughs> but still it's Kafka. And um, even there are some more portraits he was drawing. The left one is famous because it's a double portrait of him downstairs and his mother above him. And uh, we could uh, maybe uh, dispute, to have a dispute about uh, who this man is. Maybe it's Kafka, the lower one, the upper one, I'm not sure. But these have been found and uh, are produced definitely by him as well. My favorite one is this one, this angry man who is uh, having a hard time with his glass of wine or beer, whatever it is, on this table. And uh, it's very impressive in my eyes. And um, coming back to what I've promised to you before, um, Kafka's Hebrew studies. Well, that wasn't new for us that he was doing studies in Hebrew. And we have for many years already um, a notebook where he was writing down Hebrew vocabulary with a German translation in order to study it. Um, he did so <clears throat> when he followed his studies, read texts, and maybe had discussions with his teachers. So this one was new to us, and uh, I also uh, consulted in the meantime the leading scholar on Kafka's Hebrew studies, and he assured to me that this one is absolutely unknown. That was the real sensation, and definitely for his thrill, because that shows something uh, which wasn't uh, taken for granted, that Kafka was showing interest in very Jewish matters as, for instance, the Hebrew language. So this notebook, again, includes some word lists, but not just. We have even short texts which are written in Hebrew, which is not so bad. And exactly this double page, and in particular the, the right side of it, uh, enabled us to to give it um, a concise date because in this text here Kafka is referring to a teacher strike in Jerusalem. We knew that it that this notebook most likely was filled around 1920 plus minus, and uh, with the help of our great uh, web resource, the Jewish J Press, Jewish Historical Press, we could find. Uh, newspaper um, uh, articles about this strike, which was taking place in November 1920, so almost 100 years ago. Um, the reason was the same as always. Uh, teachers felt that they don't get, get enough uh, salary and they were asking for more and uh, blocked schools and so on and so forth. 
So there are certain theories what, what this text is about. Uh, the simplest one, and uh, in my eyes, uh, most unlikely that it's a real one, is that Kafka just copied this text from a newspaper article. And I would say that's too simple. I think my idea is that uh, his teacher, who was a young woman from uh, Jerusalem, Pua Menchel, um, who was coming to Europe in order to study there at the university and giving uh, private lectures, uh, lessons in, in Hebrew, she asked him, or maybe she read with him together this newspaper article and asked him for a homework to, um, to rewrite the story in his own words. So following this idea, I have to admit that it's not bad. It's, it's a good Hebrew, it's readable, and it's totally uh, correct in, in Hebrew grammar and in spelling. And which is even more touching, the, the left uh, page is a private note to his teacher where he write to her that he made so many mistakes in his homework by purpose in order to keep her busy until he will come to the next lesson to her home. And um, at the end, he said, uh, well, don't be angry about me. I'm also already angry enough for both of us. And he was signing with the famous K, which you can see downstairs, see, um, not in Hebrew, but in Latin letters. So that was really a, a big surprise for us. And uh, we were very, very moved in Switzerland in, in, in the building of the bank when we opened this for the first time and understood that he is something very crucial, actually, for, for Israeli culture. Because um, the, the whole uh, court story I was mentioning before was actually um, followed by fierce media debates about the question how rightful is the National Library's demand to get those materials to Jerusalem, to Israel, to the state of Israel and the state of the Jews. Because Kafka was not a Zionist, which is maybe true. He never came to Palestine, which is also true in fact, but as we know, he intended to do so. It was a bit late when he came to the conclusion. In 1923, he was too sick already to come to Israel or to Palestine. But he was discussing it with uh, Hugo Bergman, a uh, former schoolmate of him and director of the National Library then in those days. And most important, he did study Hebrew and he was really coming to a quite advanced level and was fluent in, in writing at least. And uh, there's also some uh, indication that he was uh, kind of laughing about uh, his Zionist uh, contemporaries in Europe who were all the time fiercely debating about the fate of the Jewish land, but never leaving to there. Instead, they uh, continued to live in Europe. And uh, most of them were even unable to uh, say a word in Hebrew. And he at last said, well, I do know Hebrew. So that was giving him a kind of pleasure uh, to follow this study. So what would Kafka by himself say about the whole story I just presented to you? I think he would have been astonished that his best friend didn't fulfill his wish. But on the other hand, if we do believe to the words of Max Brod, this is what Max Brod told him, don't expect me to do that. So he must have taken it into account that uh, things might end up differently than he was intending. Um, I think he would have been a bit uh, embarrassed to see that even his most private thoughts in his diaries and so on have been published. That's also a question of uh, how do you deal with those materials, which are on the one side uh, first class internationally acclaimed uh, materials, cultural assets, of course. And uh, should you lock them away? Should you um, uh, hide them away? Or should you really present them to the larger audience of the international readership. And I think this is the idea that Max Bode all the time had. He was so convinced right from the beginning that Kafka is a brilliant author and that his works definitely deserve to be published and to be read by a large audience. And Kafka was so unsure whether Bode was correct or not. And at the end, he left it to his decision. And I think Bode decided in the right way. So thank you so much for the moment. And if you do have questions, please feel free to ask. Yes, um, Doron, maybe you can open up the microphones to all of them. Microphones are released. All yeah. right. And Stefan, maybe um, take away the presentation so yes. we can see people.
<clears throat> okay. So uh, would anybody like to ask a question? Um, before asking, be sure to unmute your microphones. Uh, just Michael Jesselson here, just a quick question. First of all, uh, this was an extraordinary uh, presentation. I learned a lot and I thank you for it. Thank you very much. It really is super it's terrific and it, it's, it's a great uh, combination of a, the greatest, one of the greatest Jewish writers, Europe, Israel, and the National Library. It's a great story. Um, I may have missed it, but I didn't hear in the presentation about the book Metamorphosis. Where did yes. that, I didn't hear about it. Maybe I, I may have, did I miss it? No, 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 you didn't miss it. I didn't even mention it for a single time. You're right. And that's a special story. Of course, that's maybe the longest piece that Kafka was willing to release during his lifetime. It's not really a novel, but it's a long story. And it has been published in the mid uh, World War I um, in, in Germany and Leipzig with Code World Publishers and later on worldwide. So um, I think this manuscript was never actually in the hands of Max Brod. It was for any reason um, staying with the, with the family side which uh, continued to live in Czechoslovakia even through the years of the Holocaust and they hid it away somehow and kept it until the 1970s in Czechoslovakia. I still could find some uh, indication that the National Library got into contact in the 1970s with the family and very clandestinely they were able to microfilm it because um, as you know ah. back in those years um, Kafka was not really an accepted author in communist Czechoslovakia and uh, the family was uh, willing to to get access or to grant access to the to the manuscript it has been microfilmed and disappeared again and later on it um, reappeared in England. So it was somehow smuggled out of Czechoslovakia to the, the other side of the family living in England and today it's kept in the Bodleian Library as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. There's we welcome them. them. Okay, go on. So I would love to ask two questions. Stefan, thank you very much. Really super interesting and very relevant. Uh, thank you. Where can we and when and if can we see this, these um, original materials, specifically the drawings that you mentioned that are really very unique? And the second question would be, if I may, so what is now still missing in the whole mosaic of, of Kafka original works mm -hmm. that may be hidden somewhere or, or not? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So, um, first of all, uh, I began right away to, to sort those materials, to arrange them properly and to catalog them. I have not finished the whole archive of Max Brod, which is a huge one, but I knew that, of course, the Kafka items are the most popular ones and uh, will very soon be asked for uh, by, by researchers and uh, people showing interest in it. So all of these have been catalogued and I just today got the information that next week most likely a very um, a professional photographer who is uh, cooperating with the National Library for years and years and also other institutions worldwide will come to the library in order to digitize all of those materials and uh, we will upload them very soon. Uh, free access, of course, because uh, Kafka's works are uh, public domain, so there's no copyright issues going around anymore, okay. which is, of course, uh, good for us and good for users. Um, uh, concerning the question what's still missing, there's uh, some testimonies about uh, manuscripts that Kafka produced uh, when he was living with his girlfriend in Berlin in the shared apartment. And she was unwilling to give them away to Max Brod when he asked the friends of Kafka after his passing to hand uh, over to him the materials. She said, no, 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 these materials stay with me. And uh, she was not right doing so because they disappeared in the meantime. We know that she, after the, the story with Kafka later on, um, married a German communist. And they were continuing to live in Berlin 
The communist, of course, was uh, after 1933 arrested by the Gestapo, by the uh, Nazi uh, um, police, and uh, was interrogated. And his um, apartment was also opened and uh, put upside down. And uh, every single piece of paper written was confiscated by the Gestapo, and most likely also all those Kafka documents, manuscripts. So um, since then, we have no clear signs uh, about the whereabouts. It could have been that they have been destroyed during the war, of course, air raids on Berlin. There's some story going on that all these documents have been found by the Red Army after 1945 and have been exported in uh, parenthesis to Moscow and disappeared there in uh, secret archives. There's another story. I was told that all these papers confiscated by the Gestapo um, were given back to Eastern Germany in the 1960s. There have been several stories of restitution of materials taken away by the Russians to Eastern Germany, especially when it was related to uh, East German communists. And uh, there's some rumors that those materials are still uh, existing in the uh, Federal Archive in Germany, uncatalogued. Um, roughly about 9,000 uh, meters, shelf meters, which is a huge amount. Uh, very recently I heard that these rumors are not true, that all of these materials have been catalogued and there's not a thing, single piece of uh, Kafka among them. So. Uh, all these uh, Kafka stories are still a bit, um, yeah, uh, mystical. It's um, people who, who learn something about them are not uh, very open and very willing to, to share their knowledge with others and um, things uh, remain a bit uh, dark, I would say. And um, there is, of course, uh, another thing, and maybe uh, well, that's not really that's not Kafka manuscripts, but we do know that among all these materials held by the Hoffa family in Tel Aviv, there have been letters by close friends of Kafka, friends and girlfriends, uh, sent to Max Brod, and all these materials letters disappeared. We couldn't find them. We knew that they were existing in bank vaults in the 1980s in Tel Aviv. This bank branch doesn't exist anymore. We don't know what happened to those materials, and uh, yeah, we are still hoping, and with us, many others. Any other questions or comments? Um, I will point out that, you know, just recently the Sammy Rohr Prize was awarded to Ben Ballant, who wrote the book Kafka's Last Trial, which covers some of this story. Uh, he spent a lot of time, I believe, with Ava Hafe and, uh, and her story. Uh, also, Nicole Prouse's recent book, Forest Dark, includes uh, some of this information. And there's a whole part of that book that takes place on Spinoza Street, which is the apartment where Ava Hafe uh, lived and where Stefan and some of some other colleagues from the library when they were finally allowed to enter her apartment and take out um, the stuff from this kind of mysterious apartment on Spinoza Street. Um, Stefan, would you like to say just a few words about what you found when you walked into that apartment? Yeah, that was an incredible place. I wouldn't really call it an apartment any longer because it was uh, heavily neglected and was populated for decades and decades by several generations of cats. And uh, there have been uh, reports about that, that the apartment was crowded with cats and uh, most likely even in the 1980s when a colleague of ours uh, who passed away in the meantime was going there in order to check the situation and she was horrified by those piles of uh, manuscripts and on each pile, according to her description, was sitting a cat. So um, it was, there was, there have been doubts by others that this may have been the situation, but after I ended the, the apartment um, a year and a half ago, I can just assure you it was most likely very true because uh, this apartment was first and foremost um, 
a place for cats and not so much for human beings. And in the meantime, also a kind of a number of other species have mixed in. I don't want to uh, point out what exactly was running around there. But uh, I, at a certain point, I thought, well, that would have been the perfect place to find the manuscript of the metamorphosis. So, but it wasn't there. <laughs> so, and um, it was also uh, crowded and filled with all kinds of um, plastic bags filled with whatever you would like. So that it was really hard to localize the actual place of the materials locked away in cabinets and shelves. And there was no electricity in this apartment. And we, weren't, we wouldn't uh, learn about that before. So we came there quite unequipped. That was really a nightmare this day. And it was in September in Tel Aviv. And those of you who know what that means, it was really a double nightmare. So uh, we had to come there for a second time in order to finish the work, uh, but it was useful. It was really helpful to go there because we could find many, many materials of Max Groth's uh, estate, which haven't been evaluated at the highest prices on market, I would say. And uh, for that reason, they remained in the apartment. But these materials, of course, filled all those gaps I could uh, learn about uh, in the materials. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, then I just want to say thank you again, Stefan, for you know a fascinating presentation. So. Uh, it's been it's been a very exciting piece of the National Library of Israel's story, uh, and you know sort of has played out over many years. Oh yeah, uh, and. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful story and it was a great presentation. And I wanna remind everyone that we are launching the International Reading Room in a few weeks and we will send you a link and there will be an ongoing series of lectures, presentations, discussions uh, in English and other languages. Uh, and we welcome you to join. So. Thank you. Thank and you to all of you. Good night in Israel. Good afternoon in New York. Enjoy the rest of your day. Right. Good the link to reading room is in the chat if anyone wants it. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. You're welcome. Oh, and thank you to Daron. Thank yes. you to Daron <laughs> Levin, without whom the, the production would not have happened. I, excuse me. And also uh, I want to thank Aviva Zeller for helping with coordinating things as well. Daron, yeah, as I, always, thank you. As the link in the uh, chat will disappear in a second, could it be sent around in an email, please? Sure, sure, we'll send uh, the link to the reading room. And also when you do have the international reading room and the courses in many languages, Will you provide uh, translations? Uh, that's a great question. We haven't fully decided how, uh, whether we'll be doing subtitles uh, on some of the Hebrew stuff, because right now the reading room, you know, I would say 97% of it is in Hebrew. And the idea is that now we, we recognize that we can welcome uh, visitors from around the world we're we're deliberating about the subtitle situation, but thank you for asking. Or an audio channel. Maybe you can also look into an audio channel. Yeah, well, you know, they're all recorded. What we're finding in our current reading room is that about half the people who watch an event watch it live, and about half come and watch it, watch the recorded. So, for example, this event will also be recorded. This was recorded and will be available in the reading room. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks.